Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 6th of September. Today's topic is not 81 Dash. It's encouragement in the classroom with Joan Young. I'm Lori Moffitt, one of the co-hosts of the show, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore, who's doing closed captioning today. Um, closed captioning is even accessible with the recording. Thank you, Tammy, for doing closed captioning. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will introduce Joan for us. I am so excited to have Joan on the show with us today. And I sincerely apologize for getting the topic wrong on this slide. I can't believe I missed that. But Joan is so uh, motivating. And I had the opportunity to hear her interviewed during the Reform Symposium Conference. During They had some author interviews. And she got on and talked about her book. And I was so motivated, I immediately went and bought it for my Kindle, read it, and then went to her presentation during the conference. And I have to tell you, it was just so encouraging to me to hear the kinds of ideas she shared. And she ran out of time there. And I thought, 25 minutes is just not long enough to talk about this. So I'm going to invite Joan to come and share with us and give her a whole 45 or 50 minutes to talk about it. So today, she's going to be doing that. And we are really pleased to have her. Joan is a middle school learning specialist right now, but she taught kindergarten and first grade and fourth grade for many years. She uh, teaches in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. She has her master's in clinical psychology, so it's no surprise that she has some insight into encouragement in the classroom. And she is passionate about helping kids discover their strengths and become excited about learning. She also works as a one-to-one -one coach or tutor with kids who struggle with learning due to challenges like ADHD, depression, executive functioning issues, Asperger's, and dyslexia. And she says she learns so much from her students, and that's a sign of a great teacher. Her interests. Her main pastime over the past year is something very special because she has a new grandson. And all of us who are grandparents can definitely relate to that. She also loves everything creative. She loves music, making crazy cards for holidays, taking photos of beautiful sunsets, working out, running on the beach, baking delicious cookies. And she also loves exploring new ways to engage kids in the classroom using positive emotions to set the tone and safety for taking risks in learning. So with that, I want to turn the microphone over to Joan and ask her the newbie question for today to get us going and lead into her presentation. I'm sure all of you have heard this saying, you should never smile at the kids until at least Thanksgiving. And that's supposed to be the best tip for classroom management to new teachers, right? Well, I'd like Joan to start us off by talking about how does encouragement relate to classroom manage and that myth about not smiling at the kids. So take it away, Joan. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. And um, as many of you might also experience, when I present in front of teachers and other educators, I get a little nervous. So I'm taking my breaths over here and um, <laughs> going to uh, talk about this newbie question really quickly and then jump in. So. I really I read the book that that advice came from early in my teaching career, and it just uh, deciding not to smile at the kids just didn't work for me. I think that the message behind that is have structure, um, give clear expectations, let the kids know that you can handle whatever happens. But I really think it's more important for you to let the students know that it's their environment too, and that we all have to create 
the kind of classroom management that will help us all learn. So I'm going to move on from that. Um, I don't believe that myth, and I hope that after this presentation, um, you think about the way that your affect and your interaction with students actually encourages them, which will lead to their uh, belief in themselves. That's what I believe. All right. A little tiny bit about me. Actually, Peggy already said all this, so I'm going to jump ahead. Um, I do have a varied background, and as you can see from my professional career, I don't stay with things um, <laughs> as long as some other people. I've jumped around to various positions, and right now I'm working as a learning specialist in a middle school while also working with some private students who have um, Asperger's ADHD executive functioning issues. And it's the perfect match for me to be back in the school community half time and to also be working in a sort of counselor coach role at, at another time. All right. This is just a slide that I made a, a while back. I do believe that if we nourish kids, their hearts, their minds, their spirits, kids will flourish. I don't believe it's enough to have uh, good grades, good test scores. I believe it's so important that we think about children and helping them flourish, not just survive, not just be there. So um, that's my little pitch for um, kind of a whole child approach. And if I'm talking fast and you want to raise your hand and tell me to slow down, feel free. Um, I just have a lot to share with you. And um, if you could see me, I'd probably be talking with my hands if you were face to face because I'm Italian and I do that. But anyway, um, I hope people are seeing the slides. I see them and maybe someone else can um, answer those questions in the chat. I also am the kind of student who likes to um, be more in the audience <laughs> and in the chat than on stage. But I'm going to try to stick to my slides and look at the chat later. So at the end, we'll, have, we'll hopefully have time for some questions. And um, I hope that you're going to be sharing with each other because really this is about you sharing your wisdom with each other as well as kind of pinging off of ideas that I might also present. And when I, okay, so my biggest goal is to leave students with the idea that they have what it takes to accomplish anything they set their minds on. Um, building self-efficacy is really my main issue. So building that belief. So my book was called Encouragement in the Classroom after I'm going back and back and forth with the um, publisher, but I really wanted it to be about building self-efficacy helping students develop a growth mindset. So that's really what my biggest goal is. And all of this work that I do is in service of helping students develop those, that intrinsic motivation and those skills to be able to accomplish their goals. Um, with that, it's really important that we are ready to handle the emotions and the situations that students bring. These are emotion cards from a company called Six Seconds, and I use them to Build emotional literacy. Um, they're a great way to do an emotional, do a quick check-in during morning meetings. Students can pick a card and share just the card if they want about how they're feeling. They can attribute a word to that card. There are no words on the back. So it's a great way to talk about how certain facial expressions mean certain emotions to other people. And maybe they mean something else to us. And also, I model that you can sometimes be feeling simultaneously opposing emotions at the same time. It's a very quick way to integrate some um, emotional literacy into your curriculum. And when I ask, are you ready to handle the emotions, what I'm asking is positive and negative, we need to be able to handle what kids bring. It doesn't mean that we react to them, but we need to be able to notice, teach kids to notice, and figure out how to maximize learning. Because actually, learning happens most when the brain is emotionally engaged in some way. Um, so what are some of the barriers that get in the way of you achieving your goals? Um, I say name them to tame them. It's an it's a, um, important phrase in kind of emotional literacy that if you help kids identify emotions, that in itself helps them to react in a different way. Of course, that needs time, and you have to build that in. But um, I think for me, some of the barriers and some of what I've heard is that um, what 
kids bring to the classroom, their challenges at home, time to teach everything we want to teach. There are so many things that can be barriers for us. And you can feel free to share in the chat. At the beginning of my book, I recommend that you evaluate your day. You look at your day and you think, when do I have moments like this? When do I have these joyful moments? And I think you can take a record. Um, you could ask someone even observe, when are the times that kids are most engaged, willing to take on challenges? And using a sort of um, appreciative inquiry approach, look for the ways that things go well and opportunities to duplicate those successes. Often we focus on what went wrong. Yes, I see that in the chat. We reflect on what went wrong, but we don't say, hey, that split you know, two minutes where everyone was doing the right thing. I need to notice that. I need to acknowledge that. Um, and also give students opportunities to tell you, to give you feedback, to reflect. Exit tickets can be even, you know, this kind of thing about when things went well for them, when they were willing to take a challenge. Then, on the other hand, target the tricky times. This is my agenda at, um, the school that I taught fourth grade. And uh, it was really hard to stay on schedule. Our days were jam-packed. And there were times that were where I was least proud of my practice, let's just say. Things didn't go optimally at times. So for me, right after snack and recess when we came in was a tricky time to get everyone back in, to get them um, back in a learning kind of frame of mind. So some of the strategies I would suggest today are good to implement at the tricky times, and those will be different for all of us. Um, I think I saw Nicole in the, in the room, and Nicole used to teach kindergarten with me, and um, she knew that getting kids uh, back into the classroom was a tricky time, and we brainstormed ways to uh, get our kids interested in coming back in. So we had a mystery bag where we had different things kids could pick out to look at and talk about as we came back in to get them off of what happened at recess and ready to learn. So um, if you ask students what they would say builds a positive climate, I put my agreements board here. Um, a lot of kids will give you all the things that they think we want to hear. You know, we'll treat each other respectfully. We'll use our words and not our hands and all that stuff. And um, actually phrasing those class agreements is a really important part of the positive climate. Um, one of the things I used to do, and that's why I included this card here, is I used to, um, it says, Dear Mrs. Young, Happy Valentine's Day. What is your intention today? I used to post on my board my intention, whether it was take a deep breath when I get stressed or look for opportunities to laugh. And I would post my intention on the board. And students would remind me if I didn't post my intention. So I thought this was sweet that in February, uh, my student will, um, was reminding me to think about my intention. And I love that. We'll be talking about more ways to build a, a positive climate. I'm briefly going to introduce some people who have inspired me. Uh, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, um, there are lots of links in the live binder, so don't worry about trying to click anything. Um, she did a lot of research on how positive and negative emotions affect our ability to process and our cognitive flexibility. Um, her main contribution that got me thinking about all this was the broaden and build theory. So basically she did research inducing positive emotional states through having students watch some kind of humorous video versus having students watch a scary video. And what they found was that inducing a positive state meant that students could actually perform better on a test, that they could also take that positive experience and it, it could lead to a flexibility in thinking. So um, I'm not doing it justice in this very quick synopsis, but there are a lot of papers that she's written. She wrote a book called Positivity. And it explains exactly what's behind um, the theory of the broaden and build. Um, there's also some powerful research about the negative, like I said, that 
a negative experience can lead us down a, a rabbit hole where we just can see the negative and we shut down. And that's where I was talking at the beginning of the, uh, in one of the poll questions about the optimal ratio of positive to negative. There's a lot of debate going on in the psychological community about what that optimal ratio is. But what we do know for sure is that negative overpowers positive. And I'm sure you can all think about a time when you got an email from a parent or had an interaction with a coworker that was a bit stressful. And then you had to turn and teach your class. And all you could think about, even though all this wonderful stuff was going on with your students, all you could think about was that negative experience or the way someone looked at you. Or So the negative is at least three to five times more powerful than a positive experience. And so it doesn't mean we go around saying, oh, you're wonderful, everything's great. But, you're, but you think about how powerful these emotions are for students, especially since they're children. We're adults, and we can go through a process and help ourselves out of it. But kids can get stuck in a downward spiral. Judy, Dr. Judy Willis is another one of my kind of mentors that I really love. Dr. John Medina, Brain Rules, he has some great short videos that explain, explain how the brain works. And they're great for, um, some of them are great for students. They talk about how exercise is important, um, how visuals are important, all that kind of thing. Dr. John Brady talks about the importance of exercise. Dr. T Todd Cashton talks about the power of curiosity. And you're probably all familiar with Dr. Carol Dweck, author of Mindset, um, which has highly influenced my work as well. There are many threats to a positive environment. and um, I couldn't resist showing this storm cloud here. Uh, it was a beautiful trip to Hawaii. And um, <laughs> I just want you to think about the factors that pose threats to maintaining a positive, effective classroom environment. I'm going to mention a few. You guys can mention a few in the chat. But I think test the, just the focus on testing, the things that kids bring from home, the pressure on ourselves to perform, all the time. There are so many things uh, where we have to sort of make our class a safe haven. So how do we do that? Um, one of the things that I really want to point out, <laughs> and here are two contrasting um, aspects. On the left is a little boy who was in my kindergarten class who I taught to give himself, there are five smileys on his face, and he's evaluating his own work because he used to come in front of me and march his paper in front of me. I called it the paper parade. And um, he used to say, how did I do? Is it good? Is it good enough? And I said, well, how do you think you did? So I taught students self-rating even in kindergarten, and he gave himself five um, smileys there. The guy on the right is making fun of, <laughs> with my permission, the stoplight that my school used as a, a school-wide discipline system. So he put everyone on red. He turned the stoplight upside down. Well, no, it was uh, that's the way it goes. But all the pins were on green. He put them all on the top, making fun of it because he knew that even though the school adopted the system, that I really had a hard time with it. I pretty much didn't use it, even though I was supposed to. I would talk to my students when they had an encounter or they needed some guidance. I would not use this method of, you're probably all familiar with it, moving the clip to another color. And that's something that um, you all have to decide for your own positive environment. I'm not saying that the stoplight method is not part of a positive environment, but for me, it was not. So um, just something to think about what kind of messages you give by uh, the way you give students feedback and the way you help them manage their behavior. Um, I try to have a positive lens. That doesn't mean rose-colored glasses. That means I look for students' strengths. And I try to help others use those strengths to kind of address the challenges or the impact of the challenges. So I do have practical ideas to share with you. And they fall under these um, categories, rituals and routines, movement, music, spontaneity, novelty, and fascination time. So one of my favorite things was developing creative jobs for my students. And one of the favorite, favorite jobs was a classroom environment engineer. So basically, for the week, a student was classroom environment engineer. And what that meant is that student could bring in a picture, 
a short video that they sent to me first, um, a song, a cartoon, anything that would lead to a positive experience. Uh, some one of my students shared um, a story of traveling cross country with his aunt that it was just hilarious, and he had the whole room just on the edge of their seats. It was great. So what I'm really inviting you to do is to to sort of think about the traditional jobs you have in your classroom and think about the ways that they empower your students, that they bring about successes, that they bring about positive um, emotions. So I had the classroom environment engineer. I had a, a classroom photographer to capture those moments when students were presenting, that kind of thing. Um, so lots of different kind of jobs can be, I had a classroom ambassador to welcome visitors, and um, I'd, I'd really encourage you to think about whether the jobs are adding to your class or they are something else for you to manage that's not going as effectively as you think, because we don't have to do things that add more work if they're not adding benefit, if that makes sense to you. Um, also, I invite you to mindfully design routines that capitalize on positive experiences. So. Um, I know that when I first started teaching, I was kind of afraid of when kids would burst out into laughter. I was afraid I wasn't going to, and I'd hear this phrase from my coworkers, I wasn't going to be able to get them back. And so um, I think it's a myth to think that if you let them run away with laughter, you can't get them back. Don't we want them to be in that state? We just need to then teach them to take deep breaths to kind of learn how to quiet themselves down. Um, this is a scene from an afternoon in kindergarten with my wonderful uh, intern teacher, Nicole, who um, we decided to do a poetry reading and um, make the sounds of a thunderstorm because things were not going all that great that afternoon, as I recall. It was a bit of a, a long day for these guys in kindergarten. and. Um, so we decided to take out these instruments and make thunder and rain sounds. And it was a great way to get everybody back to a kind of a calm place. Um, I think that it's, it's really interesting to experiment with music um, to help induce states of calm, to help kids get engaged. Very powerful. Um, I use music for transitions. Oh, that, that wasn't all the students, but they were some absent ones. <laughs> I heard somebody was talking, they said 17 students, there were probably 20 or a little over 20 in the class. Um, so music's great for transitions, to introduce concepts, to um, use for music, movement in the classroom. And one of my favorites in fourth grade was I had my students, as one of their options for a project is they created songs as a book project. So um, they took a popular song and changed the lyrics. And I did one for Maniac McGee. Um, I'll have to hunt that down on YouTube somewhere. Uh, but when I modeled and showed that I could actually make a song for learning, my students also took the um, challenge of doing that as well. I also have songs for teaching sight words. That was one of my books introduced in the, in the beginning of the presentation. And I actually wrote those sight word songs because I taught in a very, very um, challenging school in the Central Valley of California, and uh, I noticed that my students were learning to write and read color words because we had these um, these great songs from Frog Street Press, and they were learning how to spell purple, but they couldn't learn how to spell said. And so I wrote these sight word songs, um, and it was amazing that students started learning their sight words. And I also had in the song, I also have in the song some things about the words like he and she and how he's for a boy and she's for a girl. So it wasn't just memorizing, it was really helping them learn how to use words in context. But anyway, music is uh, I think an underestimated resource in the classroom. Chimes, um, now with all of our devices, with all the different alert chimes, you can assign different, you know, those those chimes that we have when the timer ends for different um, different signals to students. So we're not always relying on our voice to direct them. Students love novelty and transitions once and, and routine, but really changing it up once in a while is actually fine. You don't have to do the clap, 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 clap all the time. 
All right. So I mentioned novelty a little bit, but really, um, Judy Willis talks a lot about this in her um, book, about how novelty really gets, it helps keep kids kind of engaged and excited to come to school. Because if there's some novelty, you know, on a regular basis where they don't know what's going to happen, or something happens in a different order, or you teach from a different part of the room, if you still lecture, but anyway, if you stand in a different part of the room, you all gather in a different place, um, it, it's powerful in, alert, in awakening their senses. Um, I love to do different accents when I'm talking to students. I, I'm from New York, so I, I can talk like I'm going to drink a cup of coffee. And my fourth graders loved it when I would lapse into my New Yorker character. When things were getting frustrated, I, I relied on my crazy voices. And I'm married to a British guy, so I can do, I can do that a, a bit as well. Um, <laughs> I would start singing the directions <laughs> when I'd get frustrated. And uh, they think that that is hilarious. There's something about singing, about chanting, about rhyming that just says, oh, great, I want to pay it. I want to do that, too. Um, I've done conga lines in my classroom to get kids from one place to the other. I've done all kinds of crazy things that are both spontaneous and often planned because I know that if students are staying in one state, they're sitting, they're listening, they're, their brain is not going to be alert. All right, be spontaneous. Um, there's a teacher, I'm actually not sure. I think it was Iris Sokol. Um, you can find him on Twitter, who shared um, a school where Pam Moran, the superintendent, where students were actually writing on the floor and the desks with dry erase markers. So I, um, I tried it out. And I had these you know, field desks anyway, so I really wasn't that worried about marking them up. But, Anyway, I, I didn't tell my students I was going to allow them to write on their desks. We actually used white or dry erase little individual boards for math practice. But I walked up to one of my students' desks and just started writing a math problem on it and said, you guys get to do your math practice today on your desk. And you would have thought that I brought them candy or something. They were just so excited to do something spontaneous and sort of against the rules, like right on the desk. And it wipes right off, by the way. Um, I say that you can modify these strategies for challenging teen years. So I think the ideas behind them, I'm just looking at the chat for a minute. I think that um, you have to get behind the behaviors that challenge you in the teen years and see what makes sense. If you can get behind what that behavior is seeking out, then you can address strategies that will use these um, ideas. So a lot of people use genius hour, fascination time. Um, I, in kindergarten, called it fascination time. This was years before I heard of Google 20% time. Oh my goodness, my sister just joined the session. How exciting. Hi, Ree. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, I posted these, hi, these um, images by my uh, sink and drinking fountain because my students after recess often had a hard time kind of settling in. So I had this fascination board where students could come and choose just to look at one of these amazing creatures and take a deep breath and just sort of reset themselves. So I used fascination as a fascination time, like a genius hour kind of thing. And you can look up other teachers who do that, giving students time to learn about the things that they want to learn about. But I also had this, this board. Um, where I let them, I actually brought the photos in for the board, um, Peggy, but that's a great idea to let students, actually as the environment engineer, students could bring in photos for something like that as well. But if this was in kindergarten and it was an idea that began um, from me, but I, there's no reason why I wouldn't have students now, looking back on it, bring in the pictures as well. It was just a way, that was a year of um, <laughs> huge challenge. Uh, as many of you know, when you are identified as a, as a teacher who can handle some of the challenging challenges, um, I was loaded up that year with uh, students who had quite, a, quite in the range of um, their own issues. So I had to pull every trick out of my hat. Um, so fascination time, I alluded to that out of order. Sorry about that. So fascination time was, um, it was once a week. In fourth grade, I tried to do it once a week as well, 45 minutes at the end of the day on Friday. 
uh, just because that's where I could fit it into my schedule um, and kind of get away with it. <laughs> I hate to say it, but sometimes we have to close our doors and do what we know is right for kids and then sell it to our administration. So I let kids study what they were interested in studying. I let them um, also do presentations where they would share one of their skills. I'd let them work together if they liked. Um, a lot of times students would want to make movies and I uh, only required that they actually make a plan and didn't just randomly go out and shoot movies. They had to actually storyboard and, you know, it had to be a time of somewhat structured learning. We also Skyped experts in the field that were some ideas that they had. Awe and awe. So there's, a, there's research that um, looking at pictures of baby animals actually promotes a positive mood. Um, and actually, the narrowed focus that they're referring to is an ability to actually focus on a task. So um, it's interesting, and it doesn't hurt, <laughs> to, uh, during one of those times of your challenge, to put a picture that induces awe because it can impact the focus and the mood of your students. And if you're not convinced, look at all those pictures of baby animals that are on Twitter and on Facebook, and, um, and you'll see that there's something. There's also research behind it. So uh, yeah, that picture might generate a lot of conversation. Um, <laughs> there's also a great um, site in data called Write About. And if you follow them on Facebook, you can actually see they have visual prompts um, with kind of provocative questions. So um, it's right about. And um, if you go to write, I think it's writeabout.com. They're just launching. So if you go, you sign up, and you will have access this fall. I believe John Spencer, Ed Rethink, and some other people are involved in that project. And there are some great visuals and prompts to get kids um, thinking. So humor protects, and it promotes thinking. So. Some of the ways that I did that in my classroom, um, I let students uh, celebrate mistakes with humor. I made fun of my own mistakes with humor. One of the most favorite stories of my fourth grade class was actually um, when I was walking backwards and tripped over a kid in the beanbag chair and fell backwards and my dress went woo and you know nobody saw anything, but it was just a funny moment that they loved to remember for the rest of the year. Remember when you almost tripped on da 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 and, and I almost did fall on him. That was my big worry that I was going to hurt him. But um, it was just a story that kept going all year. And if we can make fun of our own mistakes, kids start to make fun of their own too. I had kids make, you know, bloopers and cartoons. Uh, we had one that was Santa's sleigh, S-L-A-Y, with a line through it. You know, we don't want Santa as a slayer. Um, Laughing at ourselves is very, very, very important. And it is a social glue that, that binds people together. There's a lot of research on that as well that you'll see links in my book. Uh, cartoons and comics are great, not only for making you laugh, but promoting cognitive dissonance. So there's a lot of research that says um, that actually making people uncomfortable and having to think uh, in a way that's not threatening through a cartoon actually helps promote um, problem solving and some of those other uh, analysis skills. Because students need to figure out the context when they look at a comic or a cartoon. Um, there's a Pinterest board in the live binder where I um, have Grammarly has a Pinterest board with tons of grammar cartoons. And um, you can use them in all sorts of subjects. You can use them to introduce a subject, to normalize challenges of learning. Calvin and Hobbes has some fun comics about how school is just, you know, kind of crazy challenging and some of the things that we're asked to do. And I love to give students an option to create their own cartoons and comics uh, for understanding and learning. So there we go. So, one of the ways that I tried to be proactive to prevent stress was to um, kind of laugh at the stress, too. So in the school that I was teaching, uh, the standardized tests were very stressful. It's an independent school. And how these students performed in fourth grade would impact where they got in to go to middle school. And so I had all the students 
kind of make their most scared face above their screen. And then um, I had them make a crazy face and we took another picture. But being able to laugh at the stress, being able to normalize and say we all feel that way, uh, it kind of just made everyone sort of relax. I was really unprepared for the level of stress that these fourth graders felt about these tests. And when I saw the looks on their faces, I was like, let's just mock it. Let's just make fun of it. Let's just lighten it up. And of course, we did some strategies like deep breathing and um, some music beforehand. And we actually gathered in the room and did a chant like like uh, like you do before a game and um, had some team building as well. Let's see. So curiosity is another under underappreciated um, resource. So Todd Cashdown wrote a book called Curious. He also has a new book with, about mindfulness with a co-author, and I'm blanking on that, but I'll try to get that later. Uh, curious, curiosity is amazing because it also has an impact on anxiety. So when you evoke curiosity, um, you, your brain can't focus on being curious and anxious at the same time. So um, I had an example on a school camping trip where I had a student who was afraid of heights and we were walking along this path and she was just, she wouldn't go on. <laughs> she just was paralyzed by her fear of the heights. So we had her move inside and we had this dad that was talking to her and then I started walking by her and I said, you know, I wonder what these rocks are made out of. What do you think, how long do you think it took for this erosion to happen? And we started getting curious and I could visibly see the reaction in her body. Um, she started smiling and she started um, just being able to manage herself in order to get through that challenge. Uh, I know some people can't celebrate with food. Um, this was just a one time a year celebration. I did it one year after the, our test. Uh, we call these celebrations s'mores, and really it was just graham crackers, a couple chocolate chips, and a couple little marshmallows. And then we took a picture of our creative concoction, and that got these kids through to the end of the ridiculous test, knowing that they got to make celebration s'mores. And I know some people have feelings about that, but for me, the reputation that Mrs. Young does celebration s'mores got me through it, got them through it, and you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. All right. So students um, also created visuals to put onto their desks um, in their own language, in their own pictures about ways to, for them to work towards goals. So one of these kids says, cool off, this is fan. Another one was relax, and then slow down, take a chill pill, because this kid was a racer on the test. On any assignment, actually, not a test, but just little visuals that they uh, wrote for themselves. We used contact paper and put them on the desk. And then um, when, my, when we had iPads the next year, I had students take a picture of their drawings or create them on Paper 53 or another app. And they actually can, but I can't remember what app it was, maybe the Remind app, where they could set a timer and actually have these visuals pop up at different times during the day. All right, um, this is an activity. Uh, what's your sentence from Dan Pink's activity, What's Your Sentence? I believe the link's in the line, live binder, and I do have a blog post about it. Um, basically, what's your sentence is about creating a sentence that is about who you want to be, ideally. And what I did with my students was had them create this sentence, and then they had to blog about how that sentence was actually going to happen. So the people that they would need to help them, the kind of steps that they would take. So um, it was really interesting to see the kinds of things that they came up with. One of my favorites is down on the right. It says, he is open to new things. And this is a student who wasn't particularly open to new things. <laughs> he was trying to help himself get to that point. Um, I did this in January as sort of a, you know, let's, let's get um, this new year on a good start, to a good start. At the end of the year, this was sort of a um, spontaneous idea because a lot of people had been writing six word stories on Twitter. And um, I had to go to a meeting and someone else had to step into my classroom. So I let them write their six word stories on whiteboards all over the room. 
And I came back and I was blown away at uh, what they had written. We lead as better learners. I know more about myself. Well, that's five words, but you know what? That's all right. <laughs> uh, I wasn't concerned about the number of words as I was. What? How are you ending this year? Uh, reframing is a very powerful strategy. And um, this is a quick story about a little girl who was very anxious about going to first grade. This was in May or June, May probably, at the end of this uh, kindergarten year. And we had students um, fill out this picture and a couple words about how first grade was going to be. And this student who was diagnosed on, as Asperger's had a lot of challenges with transitions. Very bright and brilliant little girl. Very um, challenging, impulsive behaviors and emotions that she was struggling with. So she wrote, first grade will be boring and sad. It will be unhappy and bad. <laughs> and so my uh, wonderful assistant intern teacher who was with me for the year, Nicole and I, had this little girl. Uh, we all decided we were going to go visit the teacher's class that we thought she would get for the next year. So all the kindergarten class, all of our kindergarten class went and visited the first grade class just to see how similar it was to our classroom. And after the visit, we had um, this little girl do this activity again to try to change her mindset, to try to, to embody what she was now thinking. And she wrote, first grade will be happy, first grade will be fun, first grade is delightful, oh wait, First grade will be nice. First grade will be delightful sugar and spice. So um, it was pretty amazing to see the transition from her, helping her reframe that situation. This was a guy who um, helped us in the classroom. He was uh, <laughs> he would have a hard time sometimes after recess. And so uh, his advice to everyone was walk around it. So if something's bugging you right now, just walk around it and come back to it later. So we need to teach kids that even though our emotions kind of try to rule us, we don't have to let them. We can take charge. We can notice. I think notice is one of the most powerful words we can teach kids in school, in life. Notice. Notice what's going on for you. You don't have to act on it. You can breathe. You can wait. You can walk around it. It doesn't mean you're not feeling that way. It means you get to choose. And so um, a lot of us as adults can take that same advice. Um, in this, <laughs> this refers to um, students who have history with each other. Uh, our advice had to be throw it out the window. Uh, when something is bothering you, but it's from the past and it's not going to be helpful right now, just throw it out the window. It's not helpful right now. It's not meaningful right now. It's based on what happened four years ago. The kids that I worked with um, had a lot of difficulty letting things go because they've been in the same class with each other since pre-kindergarten, many of them. And this is fourth grade. So they're pretty, pretty uh, fed up with each other at times. So they had, we had to like actually take our arm and throw it out the window. <laughs> um, I'm, this is final slide. I think I have two more slides. Uh, this is just a reminder to you and to me uh, to take pictures of these kind of things because we matter more than we know. This was at the end of fourth grade, um, and my students loved commandeering my whiteboards at rainy day recess or just whenever they could, and they set or their whiteboards. But you know, we say ours because we're the teacher, but really they were allowed to write on things when they didn't have things up. So it's a magical master, rad, super. Young, outstanding, understanding New Yorker, and genius, I think, which is ironically spelled wrong, which I think is great. Um, <laughs> so I hope that you take pictures of the things that kids leave for you. This note, I wish you could come to your house and hug you every day. I'll miss you. This little girl, little girl, she was a fourth grader. She did hug me every day. She um, felt safe in the classroom, and she just uh, was very sad about it being the end of the year. And finally, this is from Barbara Fredrickson, who I mentioned earlier. She used to be at the University of Mich Michigan, and now she is um, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. But I'd like to read this to you really quickly. Um, this was their mission statement for the Positive Emotions Lab at Chapel Hill. They've taken it off their site, but it comes from Barbara Fredrickson. And, um, 
I'm going to read it. You can read it with me. You have within you the fuel to thrive and to flourish and to leave this world in better shape than you found it. Sometimes you tap into this fuel, other times you don't. But the sad fact is that most people have no idea how to tap into this fuel or even recognize it when they do. Where is this fuel within you? You tap into it whenever you feel energized and excited by new ideas. You tap into it whenever you feel at one with your surroundings at peace. You tap into it when you feel playful, creative, or silly. You tap into it when you feel your soul stirred by the sheer beauty of existence. You tap into it whenever you feel connected to others and loved. In short, you tap into it when positive emotions resonate within you. So thank you so much. Um, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on my blog. You can email me. Um, I think that uh, you have shared gems in the chat. I don't know if there are questions. I'm going to let one of the moderators jump on now. Thanks, Joan. What a terrific presentation you just did. Yes, there were some questions in chat. Uh, let's go up towards the beginning. And this was a question that came in near the beginning when you were talking about emotions in the classroom. So their emotions are transparent in class. I would guess sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. But oh, I think it, yeah, you turned your mic off. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. So sometimes we're dealing with emotions that are transparent, and sometimes we're dealing with a facial expression as a student mm -hmm. walks into the room. And you have to really get to know that student in order to know the best way of dealing with it. I think encouraging transparency is about normalizing emotion and being open with your own emotions so that you can, you can say to a kid, you know, sometimes I come in and I have to put my happy face on because I have to be there for all of you. I don't feel like it. I'm having a hard morning, but I have to sort of take a deep breath and say, I'm at school now. It's going to be OK. I can come back to this later. I'm not sure if that addresses the question. OK. Um, I, this was okay, another great. Thank related you, for that question. Um, I did stand at the door, actually, and We didn't quite lose audio. Joan is in lag. So the audio is still here. If I ask the next next question and she answers, we're not going to hear the answer. Now I think we're back in sync. Oh, well, we, off. we missed. Okay. Yeah, we, sorry, we got I off a little bit. Yeah, I missed the question entirely. I didn't ask the next one. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> no, you didn't miss the next one. Okay. I saw that you stopped. I, we couldn't hear you anymore, so I stopped asking it. Oh, um, okay. Sorry. The next one what... deals with uh, teachers of uh, autistic students. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder how those teachers notice and manage student emotions. I think that the tricky part about working with autistic students is that there are some commonalities, yet there are so many differences. I think that taking the time to work with the parents and understanding what some of the triggers are for those students. For mm -hmm. example, the, the little girl that I had, her favorite color was red. And so we had a red bean bag that was her safe place in the classroom if she just didn't think that she could keep it together. She could mm -hmm. run to that cushy bean bag and just like put her head in it and just stay there. So we had to develop strategies and, and so students are so individual in what will help them calm down enough even to get to a point where they can address the emotions. So I think the goal, it depends on the age of the students you're talking about, but the goal is to develop some emotional literacy but really focusing on safety and security and then confidence building in themselves to give them strategies to deal. Sounds overly simplistic, but it's kind of hard to address without knowing the particular case. And people can oh, email sure. me 
as well. Um, I get people asking me questions sometimes about, you know, how to help kids deal with separation from parents, all kinds of mm -hmm. questions. So. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a cultural issue? That is, would it be diff a different conversation if you're working with UK or Thai teachers? I think it's always important to uh, look at the cultural norms and expectations of the of the students that you're working with, and if you're not familiar, have them teach you. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of looking at things and thinking of it from our own perspective. We need to stop and look at it from that child's perspective. Sometimes things that look really off to us are just normal in their family situation, and we have mm -hmm. to help work with them. So I think it's important to always remember that our world is not necessarily the world of our students. Sure, and that actually answers the next question, which is the last one. Or, or if uh, the question was, is it a different conversation with different nationalities in your classroom? And you just you just addressed that too. I think so. Um, I think that every classroom, whether it's looking at cultural differences, whether it's looking at socioeconomic differences, you have to really dig in and observe what's going on, help the students um, help you by sharing you know how they think they can be successful. When it comes from them, there's a lot more buy-in. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Those were the questions that I captured, and I haven't seen any others in the chat. So thank you so much. We'll continue with the wrap up. Thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who came. Um, it was really special to me that uh, I recognized so many faces in the crowd. Um, so thank you all so much. I learned so much from all of you as well. Yes, are there any other questions? If not, I'll turn this over to Peggy. Thank you so much, Joan. You gave us so many great ideas and an overall idea that this kind of encouragement is important, not only for our students, but for all of us, too. So lots of great food for thought. Thank you. Uh, we want to let all of you know that we have a lot more great shows coming up. And next Saturday is really going to be special because we are actually going to have five student presenters, they're from middle school, and they all created live binders in a career education course. So their teacher, Karma Yancey, is going to come on and tell us all about how she set that project up and managed it. And Mike Fisher and Tina Schneider are also going to join us and tell us about some of the of features in live binders. Uh, Mike was actually one of the judges for the live binders for 2014, and her student binder was a winner. So I hope you'll come back and join us for that. Also, September 20th, we're very excited to have Pernille Rip coming to join us to talk about the Global Read Aloud project. And then um, we haven't yet determined our September featured teacher, but if any of you have anyone you'd like to nominate to be a featured teacher, please fill in the form um, that's on the live binder so that, and I'll post it in the chat at, at, in just a moment too, and let us know about that special teacher. October 4th, we're going to do another open mic session. And this time it's going to be all about digital storytelling. And West Fryer is going to facilitate it. And then all of us are going to have the opportunity to get on the mic and share our best tips and strategies and tools for digital storytelling. So start thinking about what you might like to share. And we'll have you take the mic in October. So one other thing I want to tell everyone about before I turn this back to Lori. If you haven't heard, there is a fantastic online Google Summit going on all day today and all day tomorrow. It's not free, but for the price of $40, which I think is very reasonable, everything is being recorded. So if there are five sessions going on in one hour, 
all five of those sessions will be available in the recording, so you can go to one and watch the others later. The entire conference is filled with awesome Google educators. They're all Google certified teachers sharing their best tips about how to use Google Apps in the classroom and Google for Education. So I want to encourage you to go. You can still sign up. Even if you didn't register in advance, you can go to that link and sign up today. So I hope that you'll consider doing that. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Lori. Thanks, Peggy. This is Steve Hargadon's project, the Learning Revolution Project. He's gathered together all of his teacher PD resources, or teacher and other, other uh, education professionals in one spot, including the host your own webinar. Uh, you can do that again now in a Blackboard co Collaborate room as long as you make the session public. When you exit the room, um, I, actually I think I'm, I'm missing something. Peggy mentioned that the September and October featured, teacher, featured teachers have yet to be selected. You can nominate a featured teacher. Uh, the, you can fill out the form at this particular website, which is CR20 Live Feature Teacher Nominate without the E at the end at the end of tinyurl.com. Uh, or the form is in the live binder. You can even nom nominate yourself to be a featured teacher. As you exit this meeting area, uh, your browser should open the survey for today's show. Uh, the survey is also in the live binder if for some reason it doesn't. Um, Peggy will also post the survey in the chat as well. So there's three different ways to get the survey form. At the end of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And what's nice now is that your name shows up on this top line. Um, it didn't before. So you, you had the, the topic and the date before, but you had to fill in your name yourself. Now your name appears there. Now when you request the survey, please use a personal email address for uh, receiving the survey rather than a school email address because a lot of schools will block this particular email. The archive for today's show as well as past shows are in a an iTunes U collection, actually two collections, one video collection, one audio collection, so you can listen on a, uh, an Apple mobile device. In addition, you can get to past shows with an RSS feed link to get the um, show in an RS, RSS reader. So some people have found that useful as well. Uh, you can also get to the recording in full if you want right from the Classroom 2.0 Live site. Uh, this has a place to get to the archive and resources. That's, that's where they live in the main site. Special thanks again to our special guest, Joan Young, and to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, The Future of Education and the Learning Revolution to Weebly.com for providing the website, and to everyone today who participated in the show. Thank you all for coming. Please remember that in order for the recording for today's show to process, you do have to leave the meeting space. Again, thanks for coming. <laughs>